I'm of the view that the theme of this forum, uh, Mission Possible, Accelerating Sustainable Development Through Open Science and Cooperation, is very timely. Indeed, it is critical at the present juncture to advance open scientific partnership and innovation alongside reinvigorated leadership to ensure both public and planetary health. My gratitude goes to forum organizer uh, Frontiers, the third most cited and the sixth largest research publisher and open science platform for your driving commitment to accelerating scientific discovery. Now, more than ever, we require innovative leaders to advance multi-stakeholder partnership and cooperation in order to confront the great challenges we are now facing, including coping with the pandemic and taking climate action. Just being here in this one of the most beautiful cities, Montreux, I'd like to tell you that the United Nations has often convened a very important negotiating forums here in Montreux. Because why? Normally, the parties to the dispute, to the conflict, they normally are not feeling happy each other meeting. So I used to invite them to this uh, Montreux so that uh, just looking at all this uh, beautiful scenery, one can at least have some, some uh, leisurely mind so that in, just before uh, beginning the debate, this is the place in 2014 I invited all the parties to the conflict in Syria. Syria. It was, I was very much worried whether they would not be fighting. But looking at all this beautiful scenery, snow, white snow covered in the Mont Blanc, and they were much, much more relaxed. Now I am very happy to discuss among, amongst you in a very leisurely, relaxing atmosphere. This is what I'm going to uh, tell you, even though the subject we are now discussing is very, very serious, very serious. We have no time to lose. That's what I have been saying. In any way, ladies and gentlemen, today we are living in an unprecedented era of new interconnected crisis and elevated global uncertainty. Geopolitical rivalry is intensifying, particularly between the United States and China, two most powerful countries in terms of military, in terms of economy, and whatever. And the illegal Russian war of Ukraine represents one of the most dangerous moments since the end of the Second World War. I myself visited as a former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ukraine, uh, August last year. I had witnessed myself such a horrible scenes where people have been massacred. I have strongly urged that Putin must be indicted. If the Security Council is, was divided at the time, even they are now divided, even now, then I urged that the special criminal tribunal must be established in addition to ICC, International Criminal Court. I'm a little bit relieved that ICC has indicted him and issued a warrant of arrest. But that may not be all. We have to make sure that justice should be prevailing. As a former, as a Secretary General, now even as out of my job from the United Nations, I am speaking out that justice must prevail. If not today, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, day after soon. <laughs> Thank
Okay, thank you for your support. In fact, I'm not here to discuss about the uh, Ukrainian issue, but these are all related. There is nothing which goes alone. Everything is uh, tightly interconnected. Therefore, we have to remember that when we address climate change, when we achieve sustainable development goals, then at least the people should be able to live in, in a time of peace. In a time of peace. There should be no, no war killing people. Again, the global crisis such as armed conflict, pandemics, and climate change have underlined our interconnectedness. No country is immune. No country is free from this. Look at how international global economy has been affected. Look at all these poor African, African countries who have been starving because of the lack of grains. All these are something which we have to have a global vision, multifaceted approaches to address all this issue. They have also made it clear that we need inherently global solutions to address the challenges that we are facing now. And such solutions must be rooted in partnership and innovation and centered on enhancing health, security, sustainability, and prosperity for all. Uh, today, I'll just talk about two things. First, I'll speak about the great need to scale up public and planetary health by mitigating and ad adapting uh, to changing climate change situation in, in a post-COVID-19. And second, I will highlight the urgent necessity of accelerating innovation, financing, and cooperation to help achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, UN Global Goals. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 and other viruses of duly elevated concern, such as monkeypox, have brought the health and security implications of biodiversity loss into focus. As biodiversity and habitats are destroyed due to environmental damage, wild animals have increasingly come into closer contact with the human society. And as a result, more and more novel viruses and pandemics have spread. Indeed, nearly all of the viruses that have emerged in the 21st century, from SARS in 2003, MERS in 2005, then COVID-19 shared the characteristics of being common infectious diseases that have jumped between animals and humans. I know that uh, I am standing before so many scientists, maybe medical doctors, so it may be something like uh, I'm talking about Confucius before you know what you or talking about all preaching before Jesus Christ. So I am the least least a capable person. Maybe when we talk about science before you, but in my capacity as a Secretary General, I should tell you that I have met all different parts, different, different categories of professions, including scientists, medical doctors. Normally, scientists are not kind. <laughs> they, they don't care. They are meeting Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> they just talk in their own words. If I just confess, I could not understand even one-tenth of what they were saying. <laughs> but I had to pretend that I understand. Well, thank you very much, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> then when we were working on sustainable development goals, 
I had to have uh, all, we have uh, 17 goals, but these 17 goals were the products of not, not of me. You know, I was just one of. I was leading this campaign, but a lot of UN staff of various experiences, a lot of scientists, statisticians, economists, and business leaders. Then I thought that when we have a climate change agreement in negotiation and sustainable development goals, then I thought that we need to have a strong support and input from scientists. Scientist. So I convened a big meeting in Berlin, Germany in 2014. A lot of scientists came and I have asked uh, Madame Irina Vokoba, who was at that time a Director General of UNESCO, that you are in charge of handling and discussing with the scientists. Uh, then let's have input of all scientific advices in all these sustainable development goals. Then I had to meet statisticians whether in the implementation process these goals, each and every goals, should be testified and verified by statisticians. And therefore, I, I can tell you that all these uh, sustainable development goals with the 17 goals are the product of most intensive negotiation as well as a product of all professions, professions are participating. It has uh, 17 goals, 169 targets, and 231 index in the indices. Therefore, you can always calculate whether one goal is now progressing enough. So in that regard, uh, I'm very proud that uh, I had to uh, uh, deal with many scientists. As I said, since they were talking in their own languages, I used to be sweating in my back. <laughs> what should I? It is always me who has to make a final, a final concluding remarks. I had to pretend, you know, a lot of cases, uh, just in a very diplomatic way. Thank you very much for your contribution, SSS, without touching on scientific issues. So please allow me my, you know, sometimes pretending, pretending, but I was very passionate and I was very sincere and they always worked very hard. And thank you very much for your contribution again. Uh, let's give big hands to scientists. <laughs> now then, what is, the, what is the most serious issue at this time? I think we have to make sure that uh, according to scientific advices and the world meteorological you know, statistics that we have to keep all global temperature rise 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050. Is it possible? I don't think, unfortunately, it is not possible. The WMO, UN WMO, uh, the year before last year, uh, announced that the global temperature rise has risen already 1.1 degrees Celsius. Our target is 1.5 degrees. Then just remaining space is 0 0.4 degrees Celsius. Can we, can we really make 0 0.4 degrees coming 20 years or so? I think it is impossible, impossible. That is why we have to really raise our political, political ambition mobilize all scientific and technological innovations, and also our passion, our passion. Passion shown by the political leaders, business leaders, and civil society leaders. All this a tripartite uh, a partnership is most needed at, at this time. The Paris Climate Change Agreement, I find myself very proud. There are 
three things I'm proud of. Many, many journalists or many friends, they ask me, the first question to me, whenever they meet, what have you done? What are you proud of during 10 years as Secretary General? Uh, three things. First, climate change was agreed upon during my time. Second, sustainable development goals with the 17 goals for the sustainability of uh, our planet and people. Then third, gender empowerment, women's empowerment. I th Even though I am a just a uh, humble person, I don't boast, you know, nobody. Uh, but I think it was I, during 10 years' time, I made the huge changes in the mindset of man society that we must, we must do much, much more to empower women. Otherwise, we will not be able to live in a sustainable world. I met many difficult persons, like kings of a kingdom, where in Muslim countries, where women do not have any, any standing. So I just challenged them. Your Majesty, or Your Excellencies, that you must do much more. I was born and grown in a very, very, you know, tough, society like uh, uh, Korea, where women, so my mother, my sisters, my grandmother didn't have any place. I have seen for myself. So I really made a huge change in UN systems, and I'm still proud. Then that's why one of the, one of the foundation located in headquartered in New York created an award, taking after my name, even though it is far less important than Nobel Prize, but Ban Ki-moon Award for Women's Empowerment. So during the last six years, we have been picking out and recognizing men or women, particularly women, who have been contributing to this women's empowerment. This is what the, something which I can you, uh, uh, in a very humble way, but there are still so much more uh, to be done when it comes to women's empowerment. Without women's participation, you will not be able to achieve climate change. You will not be able to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. I just make it sure. Then I have repeatedly warning the world's people that sometimes in, the, in a very passionate way, that we have to really address the climate change argument. Then there is a saying that uh, normally where leaders, they say, why don't you do this? And they just stay backside. Then that's not the true genuine leader. Leaders must stand front and lead by example. That they have to lead by example. So when People were very much reluctant to move, to move. I decided to lead by example. I visited once Antarctica and four times Arctic region, Arctic region. Standing on the melting glaciers, I have been speaking out that glaciers are melting, sea level is rising. We have no time to wait. Let us take climate action urgently. This has been my repeated messages which have been circulating around the world. I said that uh, we don't have uh, plan B. And we don't have plan B either because we don't have plan B either. That's true. If you want to find any planet, then I don't know when it will be, whether we will have some, uh, some conditions to have uh, oxygen and te reasonable temperature, etc., etc. Therefore, uh, I think we need really to uh, work very, very hard on this. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to this, what I have been talking about, climate and sustainable development goals, it is essential 
to interlink climate action to national and global COVID-19 recoveries and the United Nations global goals, that is SDGs, as well as to further empower innovation and partnership through science-led solutions in order to realize all these UN and global goals. There, there I'm really appreciating the role of scientists present here. Indeed, holistically expanding innovative and inclusive public health efforts is critical for the future of our communities, our countries, and regions, and our world. Health is a fundamental human right and the key driver for sustainable development. Poor health can result in increased poverty, limit access to education, and stifle, stifle economic opportunities for individuals and communities. Thus, health is inherently connected to other sustainable development efforts, including peace and security, and climate change, water, and sanitation, and gender equality. Again, the, one of uh, the proudest ideas that I have done something for uh, gender empowerment. The SDGs provide humanity and our planet with a collaborative blueprint to chart a new transformational path by delivering on issues such as poverty, public health, climate change, inequality, and gender equality. Among these goals, SDG number, goal number three, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, calls for reducing premature mortality from non-communicable diseases through prevention and treatment by one-third by 2030. In a simple, uh, easy way, number three, goal number three means that there should be no one, no one, who has to die from preventable diseases. I know that there are still some diseases whose origins and cure have not been made. Uh, but as long as we have medicines and all this uh, met method to cure, then there should be no person who unnecessarily should die from preventable diseases. I know that there are still a lot of uh, uh, tropical diseases, tropical diseases, but this is a very humble but very noble purpose. So let us keep that uh, we should really save all the human beings from preventable diseases. It also targets ensuring access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. So in a variety of ways, the significant work that you are all undertaking, both at this forum and daily in your varied work, directly contributes to the UN SDG goals. In order to expand such effort, I'd like to tell you just two things. First, we must enhance expertise and knowledge sharing to accelerate action and leverage the unique and powerful roles that open science can play to help achieve by 2030 agenda then I firmly believe that uh, by doing that, this forum is taking place at a pivotal juncture for boosting collaboration, transparency, and in harnessing open science-led innovation, expertise, and knowledge sharing towards the achievement of SDGs, carbon neutrality, and resilience and adaptation. Indeed, many important means, digital technologies, robotics, artificial intelligence, 
and biotechnology, nanotechnology, and beyond have fundamental and far-reaching impacts as well as present opportunities and challenges. These new technologies hold great promise for the UN's climate change and sustainable development. They can measure and forecast, forecast carbon footprints, help eradicate poverty, bring high level quality education to all, find cures for intractable diseases, expand mankind's knowledge, improve resource efficiencies, offer carbon offsettings, and improve accountability. Now, interlinking science and technology with the progress in climate action and sustainable development at the ground level will be the greatest challenge. But science, technology, and innovation cannot be confined uh, to the use of new technologies of software. And basically, innovation is a mindset and an attitude. It means questioning assumptions, rethinking established systems and procedures, and introducing new uh, strategies. The second, while the role of uh, government will remain crucial, I believe that sustainable financing and the advocacy of the economic benefits of such emerging technologies can accelerate widespread demand adoption and commercialization at a time when our planet and humanity needs them the most. At the same time, support for the most vulnerable countries is falling too short, and COVID-19 and conflict are now further hindering the progress of climate change action and sustainable development goals in those uh, very difficult countries. In that regard, I welcome the historic breakthrough that was reached in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt uh, last year during COP27 relating to financial support for uh, loss and damage. But the, the problem is that they have agreed in principle on loss and damage, but they have not made any uh, detailed framework, pathway. So I'm urging, I have urged the United Arab Emirates UAE government to make a very detailed roadmap how the big powers and rich countries, European Union and United States, they can provide this financial and technological support for loss and damage. This is why the financial technological support for developing countries is so important. Most of the countries are not capable to addressing this. If we talk about justice, climate justice, it's quite unfair that those countries who have contributed the least to climate phenomena is now the one who are now affected most. Therefore, I have been strongly urging the United States and European Union, Japan, and including Korea, my own country, they should contribute much more for financial and technological support for uh, poor countries. We all live or we all die. There is no difference. The climate, the nature does not discriminate whether you are living in the United States and like uh, Swiss, uh, beautiful countries, or France, European countries. Therefore, we have to really save our planet Earth. That's my urge repeatedly, even after my retirement from the United Nations. And therefore, frontiers prioritization of forward thinking partnerships, including duly announced ventures Alongside the World Economic Forum, Norway and multiple universities uh, will help drive sustainability and action. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, conclude. 
now more than ever, we must illuminate a due path uh, to confront the great challenges we are facing. There is no country in this world, however resourceful one may be, however powerful one may be, like the United States, European Union, most well-to-do, you cannot do it alone. We have put all our hands on the deck together. Otherwise, we'll have to be sorry for our succeeding generation. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, let us work together to address this climate, sustainability, and also gender empowerment. That's the way. By then, we will be able to declare that we are living in a prosperous and, most importantly, sustainable world. So I think this is, I think, our moral responsibility because I think there should be no political leaders. I'm urging political leaders. They bear political leadership, but we bear jointly together moral responsibility to make this world healthier, sustainable, and prosperous. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Mr. Ban, you, you can hear from the applause how your powerful speech has landed in this room. You speak so eloquently of the need for collective action and to have a legacy just of the SDGs, just of the SDGs, not to mention uh, the climate change and gender empowerment. That is an extraordinary legacy to have and we thank you for that. So, I'd like to follow on from your talk with a couple of questions, if you don't mind. And to start with, I mean, you've, you've mentioned how we are not going to get to our uh, 1.5, but moving from our current course of three de degrees of warming to 1.5 is such a big leap. Are we equipped to make that leap? This, again, I told you already, a huge challenge for us. Uh, but we have to listen to the teachings of science. So it's not a moral issue. This is not a political issue. This is science. This is a nature. There is no one who can win against nature. So we have to do according to nature tells us, according to what scientists tell us. This is what uh, very difficult at this time. The most important thing is how we can keep this global temperature rise 1.5 degrees Celsius. Then do you know what's the average global temperature at this time? It's less than 20 degrees, 18 degrees or 18.8 .8 degrees Celsius. But now it's rising. Even in some countries like Portugal, the year before last year, the highest temperature was 47 degrees Celsius. It's almost unlivable without air conditioning and the 21st century technology. If you go many South Pacific small island, the sea level is rising because of temperature, global temperatures rising, many countries are very much worried about being submerged by the sea level tides. So we have to, uh, to do that possible, we have to make sure that by 2050, the carbon neutrality by 2050. And then the world leaders have set the mid step, like by 2030, there should be 40%, minimum 40% cut of greenhouse gas emissions. Whether it is possible or not, more than 150 countries declared that we will hit the target year 2050 with carbon neutrality, no carbon. 
then 40%, most of the countries committed, uh, but there are, frankly speaking, many countries who cannot do that. Like, uh, unfortunately, China has declared by 2060, and more unfortunately, India has declared by 2070. People can understand and appreciate what uh, China has announced by 2060. Because of a sheer, sheer size of greenhouse gas emissions, that's number one. It takes 28% of global emissions, the China alone, more than one, a quarter, more than a quarter. So we have to appreciate their challenges. Then China has announced they will build 150 nuclear reactors to use clean energy to promote, to achieve carbon neutrality. I appreciate, I appreciate. Do you know how many nuclear power reactors are around the world? There are 439 only. In France, Germany is not using many, in Korea, United States, 439 are the total number. Now China is going to build more than one third of total numbers of global nuclear reactors now. They have already 80 some. So that, I think their commitment should be, uh, should be appreciated. When it comes to India, they say that we cannot do that. Uh, we can only do that by 2070. So I went to India just to press the people, even though I don't have any mandate. I am no longer Secretary General, but I met the minister and the business leaders that that's too much. You are the only one declaring 2070 carbon neutrality. Then let us see, let us see. And this is uh, worrisome. Therefore, uh, both ways, the European Union and United States and OECD member states, they, they must provide financial and technological support to developing countries. That's their promise. In 2009, they proudly announced that we will provide $100 billion every year. But nothing. If I, don't, I cannot say nothing, but very, very little was provided. So they must keep this financial support. They must keep the political, ambitious political level. I think that's the only way which we can. Otherwise, many scientists, geologists, they warn that in 100 years time that we may face the sixth mass extinction. What does mass extinction mean? That means more than 70% of all the species on Earth will perish. Then the fifth mass extinction happened 65 million years ago. 65 million years ago. Then why then our, our next generation should suffer from this mass extinction? And therefore, the reason that we have to farm resolve is more than more than enough, that we have to really do all what we can do. That political leadership is the most important, the political leaders. Unfortunately, they look very, they have a very short-sightedness. They only care for their re-election, their domestic, domestic policies. But there will be no such domestic, no such United States, Europe, France, or United Kingdom, when we are hit by this uh, sixth mass extinction. So let us walk, and you should raise your voice. Thank you. Mr. Van, we're, being, we're trying to be as positive as we can in this audience today. So, so briefly, for the scientists in our audience, what are the greatest opportunities that we can harness now to ensure global warming remains as close to that 1.5 as, as possible? What are the opportunities that these people in this audience, what would you urge them to do? 
easiest way at this time, we have to change our way of living. Then transportation, first of all, easy way. Uh, we normally use nice, nice cars, automobiles, but all these automobiles are used all uh, uh, should be should be uh, changed into uh, electric-driven uh, cars. The European Union is leading ca its campaign. Uh, then by 2035, according to the announcement by European Union, then they will not allow any cars when these cars are, will be driven by, uh, by diesel or petroleum, etc. Then to prevent, to make sure that the message is clear, uh, the European Union Parliament uh, last year adopted what is called the C C B A M, C B A M, a carbon border, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. So they will heavily tax, tax heavily for any any cars. Uh, look, if Japan and South Korea want to. Uh, export current level of cars, then they will have to pay almost 100%. Uh, then you, you cannot make any business. There's no, no use. I met myself in my capacity as a former Secretary General, the chairman of Hyundai Motor Company. I went to POSCO, Pohang Steel Mill. Pohang Steel Mill, emits 12% of greenhouse gas emissions of all Korean, uh, Korean emissions. 12%, one, one factory, one plant. So I met them. You must change all this bonus, bonus into um, a renewable energy. So they are going to change all eight bon bonus with uh, oxygen, oxygen, the, fuel, etc. Then Hyundai Motor Company declared that by 2035, they will stop producing current type of cars and will transform into uh, electric vehicles. This is what uh, South Korea is doing. I think that Japan and most of European countries and the Americans and developed countries, they have to change all this carbon-free, carbon-free uh, technologies. Or uh, even airplanes, I don't know how airplanes can really um, reduce the emissions. Uh, I, I think that 21st century technology can do it. Therefore, that's the easiest way and most the necessary one that we change our style. Then we, as a just a private citizen, what you have to do? We have to reduce the way of consumption. Use your water sparingly. People just think that water is almost limitless. No, we are living in a world very shortage of water. So even single drop of water and even one sheet of paper, I am very conscious, I'm very conscious myself. I try to lead by example. I never throw away all these written used papers. I always use backside, backside. This I just try to show by example. People said, wow, why this Mr. Vanier, the former Secretary General, is so <laughs> minding so little things, but all these little things are very important. Uh, there are, you know, you are living in this uh, very, uh, very luxurious hotel. There are a lot of uh, runoff waters. When you take a shower, just be conscious of water. And I'm speaking to many countries. Use your water sparingly. The China has a um, good idea. I am now um, working as a chairman of a Global Center on Adaptation. Adaptation is a very important part of the climate action. There is a two-way, two-policy mitigation, adaptation. 
Now, people know a lot about mitigate, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's what we are doing. But we are not doing much about adaptation, just to prevent and to reduce our efforts to mitigate. When you go to China, I've been speaking very loud and clearly that they should do much more to uh, reduce all greenhouse gas emissions than as a way of saving this water. They create a sort of a spongy park, a spongy park. When it heavy rains, they just disappear. You don't know where. Then they just try to control to get all this water in one place. A spongy, spongy park means you just make a, some you know, lands slowly moving to the center so that water will just will come to the center and they, they put the, you know, uh, water bottles, uh, big water bottles, and ta water tanks so that they can save this water. And this is one way to adapt. Then by, by taking scientific and effective adaptation method, we can save a lot. For example, climate resilient infrastructure, climate resilient agriculture, like uh, climate resilient uh, seed, you can develop a uh, special seed, breed of seed. There are many ways, many ways. So our, our study shows that uh, if uh, we, the world, if a world invest one, $1.7 trillion on adaptation in infrastructure, water, energy, like uh, electricity, etc., then we can have at least in 10 years more than $8 trillion worth of benefit. Now, talking about, about saving energy, let me just say very foolish but funny, funny stories. As a Secretary General, whenever you travel, you are accommodated in the huge deluxe, deluxe hotel suite. Then my wife and I have been struggling to turn off all the lights to have a sound sleep. But in the end, I was not able to have a light just above my head. Whatever, you know, I tried struggling to turn off all the electricity. I thought I'm a dull, dull man. So I've been feeling very much, you know, frustrated that I was not able to turn off all the electricity. Then a few years later, I read the confession of President Obama. He wrote, I don't know whether you read it. I felt very comfortable. Oh, I'm not a dull person when Obama is like as dull as myself. He said, what is your difficulty while traveling as President of the United States? He said, well, Michelle and I have been struggling to turn off all these <laughs> hotel lights. So I'm not that dull person now. I'm happy. Then I talked to New York Mayor. New York Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor. You look at all these uh, huge uh, buildings and hotels. All the lights, all the lights are, you know, on. Why don't you advise the hotel owners to turn off unnecessary, you know, unused electric, electric bulbs. So there are many ways, many ways we can help address climate action. It's not only scientists, it's not only engineers, technology. This kind of things we, we can do from the beginning. So please keep in mind, try to reduce the consumption, consumption, unnecessary consumption uh, of our life. That's one way. Thank you very much. Thank you.